And, and at this time, I'd like to dismiss the children to uh, Children's Church. All right, well, today essentially marks uh, my seventh week here as the lead pastor, and I uh, feel like we're just getting started. I've only begun to get to know uh, many of you, and, and I'm excited. I'm excited about the, the summer winding down. Summers for most pastors just feel like times that we kind of get through, and that sounds terrible, but I'm excited about our um, community kids club that's going to be starting up in a few weeks here toward the end of August, and I'm excited about Vacation Bible School this next week, and I'm excited about the parade that's coming up. I'm excited about just things getting back to what churches would consider to be normal, and I've been sort of getting a lay of the land, not just getting to know you, but sort of processing, thinking, figuring things out, and I get excited about what the Lord can do through Community Church of the Hills. And I want to encourage you to do a little bit of dreaming, too, because we do serve a forward-looking God, and with God all kinds of things are possible. But I also want to encourage you, as you do think about what is possible in your life and in the life of this church, I want to encourage you to certainly include God in your considerations and in your conversations about what comes next. And that's true for us individually, but that also ought to be true for us collectively, because our lives belong to the Lord. And uh, this is his church. What we all need is a, a solid word from the Lord concerning what comes next, his permission, his blessing, his direction. Because it doesn't matter what your circumstances are, it doesn't matter your personal life, it doesn't matter your business life, your professional life, your marital life, your relationship life. What you need and I need is the confidence that what we're doing or what we're about to do has the blessing or the promise or the direction of, of God on it. And if we don't have that permission, or we don't have uh, that direction, or we don't have a confidence in our lives of what comes next, well, we can actually end up wrecking our lives and the lives of other people around us. There's a story in the book of Joshua that really drives this point home. And I know we've been in Hebrews chapter 11, but uh, today I want us to veer over to uh, Joshua chapter 9. And in the, in, in the book of Joshua, by the way, is about this fellow named Joshua. Like, who knew? And uh, in case you didn't know, Joshua is this man that God uses to lead his people into the promised land. But before he does that, Joshua is one of the 12 spies who goes into the promised land and checks things out. He's one of the two of the 12 who comes back with this very faith-filled response that we can take what it is that God has given to us. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit was on Joshua like no other. And so when Moses passes, it's Joshua who fills those shoes. No surprise there. And you might remember Joshua is the one who's leading the people of God when the walls of Jericho come crumbling down because there's some amazing praise and worship going on. Okay, that's Joshua. So the point here is Joshua is not a novice. He's not a beginner when it comes to walking with the Lord and following the Lord faithfully. And yet Joshua, who was no novice to walking with God and trusting in God and walking by faith, Joshua actually makes a deal with, uh, with one of the enemies in the land, and he had no permission from God to do that. And so one of the overarching lessons of Joshua chapter 9 is this. If moving forward without God's promise could happen to a person like Joshua, who knew what it was to walk with God and who had won great victories for God, it can happen to you and to me. Okay? It can happen to the, the strongest, most spiritually mature person in this room. And in case you're wondering who that is, I don't know because Beverly Veron is still on vacation. Um, but it can happen uh, to the best of us. Okay, here's, here's what happens in the story uh, of Joshua. And I'm, I'm afraid, before that, let, let's just step back for a second. I am afraid that when it comes to, to people who even are, are believers and who even walk around church and all the rest, and we kind of know the stories and we've been walking with the Lord for a, a time, I have unfortunately found that a great many of us, probably most commonly, we go through life sort of shooting from the hip and kind of hoping for the best. And we, we kind of make decisions a lot of times because it looks kind of obvious and, and we're kind of guessing and, and trying to press forward as best we can. And, we need to become the kind of people who will refuse 
to commit or move forward until we have a certainty that what we're doing or what we're about to do has the stamp of uh, God's approval. Because when we do move forward, and you've probably got some stories, and I've got some stories, where we do move forward without pausing and praying and seeking the Lord, uh, we are basically asking for, for a world of hurt and a lot of disaster, and it's not just about us, but there's collateral damage that happens when we don't pause and, and we, don't, we don't pray. So what happens with Joshua is he and his military have moved into the Promised Land. And they've been running all over the enemy like the Kansas City Chiefs did last year. Okay, they're just dominating and kingdoms are falling. But there are some kings who are still left at this point, and they're afraid. And God has told Joshua in no uncertain terms, these other people who are in the land, they don't belong here. This land is mine, and I'm giving it to you. It, it's your land. They shouldn't be here. Now the good news is there's an open border policy, but the borders have exits, not entrances, and so the people can leave, but if they choose not to leave, well then you need to take them out. And don't mess around. And don't make any deals with the enemies that are in the land. Unfortunately though, Joshua goes against this very clear direction from the Lord. And that's where we're going to pick up our story here in Joshua chapter 9. So if you would, let's go ahead and stand out of respect for God who's speaking to us through His Word. This is Joshua chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. And here it's speaking specifically of this uh, one group of enemies in the land, uh, the Gibeonites. They, the Gibeonites, resorted to a ruse. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. They put worn and patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and moldy to make it look like they were low on provisions. Then they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and the Israelites, We have come from a distant country. Make a treaty with us. But God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. So you get what's going on here, right? These Gibeonites make it look like they're foreigners from a distant land. And they point to their you know, old wineskins and moldy bread, and uh, it completely snows Joshua. Like, oh yeah, obviously you're from a foreign country, you're from a distant land. And, uh, and Joshua gets deceived. So in the time that we have remaining here this morning, I just want to talk about the hazards of having no word from God for what you're doing or for what you're about to do. And there are several no negative consequences to just, you know, doing the best, shooting from the hip, hope for the best, guessing, and just kind of moving forward without pausing and praying about what is yet to come. Okay. And the first negative consequence is this. You get conned. Okay. You get deceived. You get royally scammed. Here's Joshua. He, he knows what it is to walk with God. He's won great victories for God. He looks at their moldy bread and the old cracked wine skins and says, oh yeah, you know, duh, obviously, you're from a foreign country. Let's make a deal. And he gets, and he gets scammed. He gets conned. Now here's what I've figured for myself, and, and I think I've kind of figured this for other people, is when we get conned, it's almost like we end up deceiving ourselves. Okay? It's almost like we con ourselves, because we can get in this rut where we look at ourselves in these quick decisions that we make and we say, well, I make pretty good decisions. Uh, I'm a fairly spiritual person. And look at me, I've made good decisions in my life and my marriage and my finances and I just can't lose, you know, I just, I just never miss. And, and because we look at ourselves and we'll magnify those, those wins, we don't necessarily pause and, and pray because we just think, well, I, I got this. We think too highly of ourselves. If you've ever been conned or you've ever conned somebody else, and maybe it's just a practical joke that you pulled, okay, or if you've watched a movie about con men and all the rest, you know how it works. They build you up and build you up, and it's when your ego is at its height that you're in the position where you're most likely to crash or get taken advantage of. And so the common con goes something like this, you know, whether it's poker or billiards or whatever the game of chance is. The con man lets you win, builds up your confidence and builds up your confidence, lets you win, lets you win a little bit more. And then when your ego is all puffed up and then you put real money on the table, 
that's when they have you. That's when you get crushed, when your ego is large. And it may not be that you have an ego problem all the time, but there's that moment, and then they take advantage of it. Or here's another common con, and it's, it's a lot more subtle, but it still plays to our ego. It goes something like this. And I'm familiar with this because something like this has kind of happened to me, where you get online and you're shopping for a car. And you are really good at Googling, okay? So you've Googled for 9, 10, you know, 12 minutes on a very reputable website like Craigslist. And you come to this car that's being sold at a ridiculously low price. It's like a 2018, you know, Mustang, and they're selling for $1,500. And then you go to kbb.com, you know, because nobody else has ever heard of Kelly Blue Book. And you go and you, and you Google, and it's like, this is worth $15,000. They're selling for $1,500. This is amazing. It, it's, it's not a red flag to you. It's like it just inspires you. Like, whoa, I'm about to take them for a ride. Right? What is that? That's your ego. And then you go to the website that is associated with that person who's trying to sell it. It's like something like, you know, donatedcarsamazingdeals.com. And then you go, and then you find the website's not working. But that doesn't surprise you because obviously they're getting so ripped off they can't afford a good website. And then you Google a bit more, and then you find the number that's associated with the people who are trying to sell the car. And it's, it's Mike and Carol Brady, and it sounds familiar, but you're not sure. And so you call Mike and Carol Brady, and you leave a number, and then they call back later, and it sounds like they're calling from Mumbai or New Delhi, but still, there's no, there's no red flag. And you say, how can I lock this down? And they say, well, just give us $100 down, and you put it on the credit card, and you never hear from Mike and Carol Brady ever again, okay? You know what's going on here? You're getting strung along. Because the average person thinks they're above average. Did you know that? 90% of people think they're above average. That's the statistics. And 50% and think they're in the top 1%. That's not actually how percentages work, but that is our self-appraisal. Half of us think that we're in the top 1%. That's very average, to think you're way above average. So on average, we think that we're smarter than the person on the other side of the table, and we think we're smarter than other people around us. And, and we think that if, if it looks like somebody's getting ripped off, it's the other person. So you think, well, the deal's too good to be true. And that would just like run people away, but it actually attracts people because it builds up our ego. And we think, oh, I'm really taking them to the cleaners. And you're the one that gets taken. It's, it's the ego. And it's not just that we think more highly of ourselves than other people. We have this tendency too. it's a psychological truth. You look at past victories. And everybody's got past victories. Everybody's got past wins. There are times that you've done something and it was like amazing. And we look at those past victories and we magnify those as evidence of our smartness and our awesomeness. This is Joshua. He sees these guys that come, hey, we're from a foreign country. He's like, well, you know, what do you think I am? You know, like I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't, I wasn't born yesterday. I'm not uh, some sand dwelling camel jockey. I'm the leader of the people of God. And when I say go, we go. And wherever we go, we win. I just win victories. I just win, win, win. And very quickly, we have a tendency to forget that all the wins that happen in our lives or in Joshua's life happen only because he first got a word from God. He doesn't pause. He doesn't pray. You get scammed. You get royally scammed. That's the first hazard here. But there's a second hazard, and it kind of fits with the first hazard, and that is we have this tendency, if we don't pause, we don't pray, we don't see God's Word, we have a tendency to go by the appearances. We, we look on, this, on the surface of things. You rely on your senses. They come to him and they say to him, make a treaty with us, verse 12. This bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you. But now see how dry and moldy it is? And these wineskins that we filled were new, but see how cracked they are. And our clothes and sandals were worn out by a very long journey. Joshua goes almost entirely by appearances. And, and that's also kind of how people operate too. We go by appearances or by feelings and people are dazzled by websites or you know, PowerPoint presentations or whatever the case is. That's another way of saying when you don't pause, when you don't pray, when you don't see God, you just go by, by your gut instincts in the moment. You go by appearances. That's walking by sight, not by faith. And you know how deceptive your sight can be. We could spend some time on this, but, but we don't need to. I think the point's rather obvious. There's a third hazard by not pausing and not praying and not seeking a word from God. Because, again, 
Why are we talking about this, especially as we've been talking about faith? Because as believers, we know that faith is not about wishing something to happen. It's about responding to a word that's given. Okay, Faith, for the person who is a Christ follower, is it, it starts with us receiving a word from God. It doesn't happen with us giving a word to God. It's the positive response to a word. It's not wishing something to be. Or put a little bit, put a little bit differently. Faith, for the person who is the believer, starts with a word from God and not a word for God. You've got to pause. You, you, you need to get the word. Because if you don't, number, number three, if you don't pause and you don't pray, here's the third thing that happens. You reject the check of the Holy Spirit. There is oftentimes when you start getting off track, this little scratching on the back of the neck, this little, you know, queasy feeling in the gut that says, you know, I think you're kind of a little off track here. That's the check of the Holy Spirit. But when you have made up your mind that you can make up your own mind, you will have a tendency to disregard these things. You see that happening with Joshua. He's about to get deceived. His friends come to him, and oftentimes we do need to lean on our friends because they're not in the midst of a bunch of chaos. They're not in a rush. They don't have as much at stake in terms of their ego. His friends say, You're, these guys are crooks. They're lying to you. They're deceiving you. And he totally disregards what they're saying because, again, you're going to disregard what other people are saying if in that moment your ego is puffed up or you have to defend uh, yourself and your own particular greatness. I know, unfortunately, I hate to say this, but I know my own tendencies. I know that I have a tendency to see circumstances kind of line up or I feel like I've got a black and white permission from God to generally do something. When I don't pause, when I don't pray, and then there's that check of the Holy Spirit, I have a tendency to want to kind of rush right past it. And in my life, oftentimes, those checks have come through other people, and they've come frequently through my wife. Now, this doesn't mean that people have the permission to say, well, God told me to tell you. I don't like, I don't do that for other people. I don't receive that from other people because I have the Holy Spirit too. And I do keep my own counsel as to whose counsel I keep. But I do keep counsel from other people because I recognize that while I have the Holy Spirit, other people around me have the Holy Spirit too. And that would certainly include my wife and my family and my friends and, and certainly the elders of this church. But when we kind of just rush ahead, shooting from the hip, hoping we don't blow our toes off doing the best we can, when those little you know, whispers or those little lights start going off, we have a tendency to blow past them. And that's a mistake. Don't blow past the check of the Holy Spirit. Now, in, it, it'll, people, I've seen people wreck their lives because of this. Now, when it comes to decision making generally, there's these three lights that we depend on. There's the light of God's Word, there's the light of providence, and then there's the internal check or inclinations, leadings of the Holy Spirit. It's like this harbor in Italy. You've probably heard this illustration, but it's a good illustration. There's a harbor in Italy that you can enter only through a very narrow channel. It's kind of a dangerous entry because there are dangerous rocks and shoals on either side of this channel. A lot of ships have been wrecked there. So somebody brilliantly decided, we're going to set up three poles on the opposite side of the harbor. And when those three poles, and at night, those three lights atop those poles all line up, you know as a ship captain you can proceed with safety. But when you're going into that harbor and those three lights don't appear as one light, but they see it appears two lights or maybe three lights, you know you're off track. You better get on track really quickly. God has given us three lights. There is the kind of the black and white, Holy Spirit inspired scripture, more of a, an objective standard. Then you've got circumstance, which under the right conditions you could interpret as providence of God. But then you have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's leadership in your life. And when those three lights line up, same rules of navigation apply, you can move forward with confidence. Here's where I see Christians going wrong oftentimes. Hey, the Bible permits it. And the situation looks really, really good right now. And you look at what you think would be providence, and you look at what you see to be a divine permission, and then that's enough. And the people don't pause. They don't pray. They don't seek the Lord. And I've seen people you know, absolutely get messed up because they do what Joshua does. They don't seek the Lord at all. I could give you lots of examples of this from my own life. I'll give you an example from Scripture about how things seem to line up just fine. 
But that's not the same as getting the Holy Spirit's permission or direction on it. For example, you go to Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, there's this, there's this occasion where Paul's doing what Paul does. He goes from region to region, city to city, town to town, spreading the gospel, proclaiming the good news. And that's all very, very biblical because we've been told to go and spread the good news. We've been told to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. Paul's doing the right thing. And Paul is getting open door after open door after open door. It seems like providentially God is behind Paul, just pressing forward wherever he's going. But then there are these interesting words in Acts chapter 16. Let me read this to you. Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Paul wanted to preach the gospel in the region of Asia. Paul wanted to preach the gospel in Bithynia. It seems like, you know, there were open doors there, and definitely is a good thing to be pre spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. But for some reason, the Holy Spirit says no. Now, I don't understand why it sometimes works like this. I don't know why the person set up three poles in the harbor as opposed to two. It seems like if you got two lights lined up, then the third one's going to be perfectly lined up, but for some reason they have three. For some reason we need to go to the Holy Spirit as well. It seems like if providence and the Word of God line up and your heart's in the right place, that you ought to just press forward. But I'm telling you, there's a mystery to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the, 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 the pause is, well, not now, or maybe the pause is, well, somebody else, but not you. But we will get ourselves into trouble when we don't pause and when we don't pray and when we don't seek after God. Those are some of the hazards. But the bottom line hazard, the result of all of this, of not pausing and praying and getting God's permission or God's direction on something that we're doing or about to do is this. It results in a constant struggle. Listen to verse 14. The Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. They didn't see God's direction, didn't take time to wrestle with whether or not God was in this. Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. Now God had told Joshua, drive out the enemies from the land, but here Joshua doesn't. He doesn't know any better, but he doesn't do what it is that God wants him to do. And the consequence of all of this becomes this constant struggle in his life and in the life of the people of Israel. Let's keep reading with verse 16. Three days after they made the treaty with the Gibeonites. Ever had buyer's remorse? Three days later, boy, it stinks. And there's no receipt he can take back here. Three days after they made the treaty with the Gibeonites, the Israelites heard that they were neighbors living near them. So the Israelites set out on the third day, and on the third day came to their cities, Gibeon, Kephira, Beeroth, and kiriath Jerem. But the Israelites did not attack them, because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. The whole assembly grumbled against the leaders, but all the leaders answered, We have given them our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. See, when you've made a decision, even when it's a wrong decision, sometimes you just have to stand by that decision. Sometimes you make a wrong choice, and then you have to make the best of it, but you make the best of it the rest of your life. Verse 16. Uh, verse 20, rather. This is what we will do to them, okay? I made, a, made a mistake, but here's what we're going to do. This is what we'll do to them. We will let them live so that wrath will not fall on us for breaking the oath we swore to them. They continued, let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers for the entire community. So Joshua and the leaders say, okay, we goofed, which is nice. Wouldn't it be great if we had, like, I don't know, one politician in the last 20 years to say, yeah, I made a mistake. I mean, I don't know the last time I heard anybody say, yeah, I kind of messed up. At least they admit, okay, we kind of goofed, but we're going to be okay. Because we're going to make them woodcutters and water carriers. We're going to make, they're going to do the grunt labor. They're going to do the work that nobody else wants to do. Yeah, 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 they shouldn't be here in the borders, but we're going to make it work out. They're going to be our servants. So that's not such a bad deal. Check this out. Decisions we make without consulting God become major high maintenance headaches where the enemy attacks and resources are depleted. The enemy ends up attacking Joshua 
through this treaty with these people that he should have never made in the first place. And as it goes with Joshua, so too it goes with you and me. Anytime we make a decision or move forward without first having waited, for, without hesitating, uh, without praying about what God wants us to do, that becomes a point at which the enemy attacks. And, and we see this happening here with Joshua. Look what happens. Enemies come to attack the people whom Joshua's, with whom Joshua's made a covenant because Adonai Zedek, who is this leader of the Amorites, another in, group of enemies in the land, Adonai Zedek finds out that the Gibeonites and the Israelites are in a treaty, and so he doesn't like that. So he gets together with his other Amorite king friends. Four other Amorite kings total. He goes to them and he says to them, Come up and help me attack Gibeon because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon, joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us, because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. Now initially, when Joshua was tricked, he thought, this is no big deal. We're just making our servants. This is all going to work out just fine. They're going to cut wood. They're going to carry water. They'll do the grunt labor. This is a win-win all over the place. And now, he's become enslaved to the situation. Now, instead of them being his servant, he and the people of God are going to have to be servants to the Gibeonites because they have to come to, his def to their defense. And he has to come to their defense against this really, really terrible group of people, the Amorites. Let me, let me just give you a little history lesson here. You know how uh, oftentimes people read the Bible and say, oh, well, that's not true, or that didn't happen. And really up until the early 1900s, people didn't think the Amorites were even a thing. It's true. Because there, there seemed to be lack of archaeological evidence that the Amorites ever existed. In 1902, uh, there was a great archaeological find between uh, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and uh, discovered, oh yeah, there's Amorites. And they did all the bad things that they were supposed to have done in the Old Testament. They sacrificed children, uh, babies uh, to Molech, who was represented by this serpent. And they found these burned babies, bur babies who were burned to death, you know, sacrificed, offered in jars. And there'd be children, you know, little girls who were sawed in half horrible, horrible human sacrifice. So if you go, oh, you know, how could God ever say to the Israelites, you know, destroy them, run them out of town? They were Amorites. I mean, can you believe a culture would actually kill children and sacrifice children for the benefit of adults? Could you imagine a culture like that? God says, my judgment needs to rest on these people. And now, all these five horrible, horrible kingdoms, murderous kingdoms are coming together. And Joshua and his people have to fight on the behalf of another group of people they should have never been in a treaty with in the first place. I mean, it's, it's going to be a battle royale. Now, let me just ask you, have you ever, and this is probably Joshua, I made the best of the situation, it's going to be a workout, it doesn't work out for me at all. Let me ask you this, have you ever gotten into a relationship that you sh probably should have never been in in the first place, a business deal, personal relationship? And you just thought when you were going into it, hey, it'll all work out. And if it doesn't, if it's not real easy on the front end, that's okay. Because I can make anything better. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And doggone people like me. And if, it, if it's not real easy, I can twist and I can manipulate and I can, I can work this thing to my advantage. Again, that's Joshua. And now he's putting at the disposal of these people he should have never been in a treaty with in the first place. He's putting at their disposal the best of his men, the most valiant of all of his warriors. When you get into a situation you didn't pray about in advance, you didn't seek the Lord on, you just kind of rushed in hoping you know, for the best and you can just make it all work out. Not only do they not end up serving you this situation, you can be enslaved to that cir circumstance or that situation. It, it can be a disaster and it can last really the rest of your life. So I want to ask you a question and I want you to answer it honestly and I'm going to put this in a pointed way. Okay, but this is, I want this to be pointed because I want this to stick with you. I, I wish everybody would think through this. If you're not wise enough to seek God before entering into every situation, 
what makes you think you're wise enough to make every bad situation great? If you're not wise enough to do the obvious thing up front, which is to talk to God, why do you think you're wise enough to do not so obvious things to make this terrible situation really work in your advantage? You know, I, I, I have, there, there is this general rule of thumb with employment, with marriage, with relationships. It goes like this. 90% of the problems in the relationship, whether it's business or marital, doesn't matter, 90% of those problems happen at the altar. You should have never been there in the first place. I don't see very many situations going poorly when people, believers, actually paused and sought the Lord and prayed. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't exceptions to the rule, but I was doing some reflection on this, and I, I can't think of one situation in my life, in my life, and I'm over 20, where I just paused and I prayed and I sought the Lord and then I moved forward and it turned out to be a disaster. I can't think one of one of those situations. But I can think of a lot of situations where I didn't pause, I didn't pray, I didn't seek the Lord, and it did not go well. Those are the hazards of not pausing, not praying, not receiving a word from the Lord, just shooting from the hip and wishing for the best. You get royally scammed. And you're just going by appearances, and you're rejecting the check of the Holy Spirit, and, and it, you wind up in a circumstance or a situation where you just, it's high maintenance, and you feel stuck. And some of you are saying, yeah, 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 tell me about it, because I did this or did that, and I got in this relationship I had no business being in, and yeah, tell me about it. Well, if you're struggling, you want some good news? Okay, I've got some good news for you. God has not abandoned you, okay? In spite of the fact that we oftentimes don't do what we should do and we don't consult God and we overestimate ourselves and in our ego we get crushed in spite of all that stuff, God has not abandoned you because He's a burden-bearing God. Listen, if God loves you enough to bear the burden of your sins and my sins, well then all the other burdens that He can bear for you are cakewalks by comparison. And you see this actually happening with Joshua. Let, let's get back to the story of Joshua. Joshua chapter 10 verse 7, so Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men, and it's to defend these Gibeonites he shouldn't have had a relationship with in the first place. And in, in verse 8, the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. Okay, do you hear what God's saying, Joshua? You have this burden, and it's a mess, and you got yourself into this. Don't blame me, okay? This is your, a burden of your own creating. But it doesn't matter. Even though I didn't create the burden and it's all yours, I'm still in covenant with you, okay? I'm st this, we're, still, we're still family. I still have your back, okay? And reading between the lines, I think it's something like this. Hey, Joshua, you got tricked into a covenant with this, these Gibeonites, but I didn't get tricked into a covenant with you. When I got into a covenant with Abraham way back when and all of his descendants, I knew I would always be faithful, and you wouldn't. So I'm not entirely surprised by this, but we're still in covenant, and I've still got your back. I'd like for you to have my back, and that's going to happen some, but I always have your back, and I'm going to fight this battle. I'm on your side, period. And does God ever fight the battle? Check out what happens next. Verse 11. It says, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them from the sky. That's the, the Amorites. And more of them died from the hailstones than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. You know, this is, to me, such a beautiful thing because Joshua was so boneheaded, really. He should have known better. And the people of God were really in a bind here. And, and God had his back, but not just that. I mean, he wins this battle, and it's not just that. Um, he destroys the enemy com completely. And Joshua didn't deserve it, and the people of God didn't deserve it, but, but that's the kind of God we have. He's a burden-bearing God. He's not just wise in the direction that he gives to us. He's also loving. He's also merciful. He's, he's also for you. And you, can, you can give your burdens to God, even if they were of your own creating. 
That's why we go to him. That's why we trust him. So don't just give him your burdens partially. You know, give him your burdens fully. I, I love this story that was told by this Karabau uh, cart driver. There's, that's a picture in the Philippines. I don't think it's that driver who tells the story, but that's what I'm talking about. There's this guy who's driving this cart to the, to the marketplace. True story. He says he was on his way and he saw this old man carrying a, a load, a big burden on his shoulders. And so the driver has compassion on the old man and says, why don't you get in the back of my cart and I'll take you to the, to the market. We're all in the same direction. So the old man who has this burden on his shoulders gets into the cart and the driver continues on the way and a few minutes later he turns around to check on the old man and when he turns around to look at the old man who's in the cart, the old man still has the burden completely on his shoulders. Don't be that guy. Okay, when you step into the cart of God's grace, you lay your burdens down. Why? Because he's not just wise, he's loving. Okay? He's not just our counselor, he's, he's our savior. And that's why, that's why we go to him with every little thing all of the time. It's not just because he's wise, it's because he's also loving. It's not just because, you know, he gives good direction but because he's for us in a way that we don't deserve. And so when you start thinking not just about your own self-preservation and the benefit of your own life and the lives of your family, but when you think about his character, it really is kind of unthinkable that on occasion we wouldn't just pause and pray and seek the Lord so that we would have the confidence that what we're doing or what we're about to be doing has the blessing and the permission of God on it. Because when it does have the blessing and the permission of God on it, here's what happens. Y you win. Let's bow for a word of prayer. God, uh, we, we do... We do want to win, and it's not just for us, it's, it's for you and for your name's sake and for your glory's sake. And uh, I don't know how this applies to everyone in the room. I know how it just is applying to me. I've been surveying the land and figuring things out and processing, thinking, dreaming about what it is that we can do, should be doing as a church, and whatever it is that we do next, I pray your blessings would rest upon it. Um, so this is true for, for me as a pastor, but it's also true for us individually. And some of us, we're on, uh, we're, we're about to take a step into a relationship and, uh, and we ought to pray about it. And, and some of us, we, we know that your word doesn't permit it, or maybe circumstances aren't aligned, but even if those were lined up, we just ought to pause and pray and seek. Some of us were thinking about that in, in all kinds of directions, whether it's with our family or, or friends or business or church or where do we plant. Lord, I just pray that, that, uh, that we'd be wise enough, humble enough to turn to a God like you who's humble enough to support us even when we are not deserving of it. And you in the past have gotten us out of one bind after another, after another, after another. And in your humility, I think, you've been communicating to us, maybe, maybe you could be trusted. <laughs> Lord, keep us out of the trouble, get us out of the trouble that we're in, but help us, Lord, from this day forward to move forward with wisdom and, and humility and grace so that in the year ahead, our lives individually and corporately would appropriately reflect your glory and your goodness and your wisdom. May we not shame you but advance your kingdom in the best of ways. Help us, Lord, to walk by faith, responding positively to the word you've given to us, and not in a silly way of just us giving you whatever and saying, bless it. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.